Okay. And it looks like folks are streaming in. Yeah, it's a good sign. <laughs> We got a couple more minutes, it looks like, for people to join us. So we'll get started here in a couple minutes. So you'll need to enable uh, screen sharing for me. OK. It says that it's disabled. It should. Okay, it should be set. No, it still says disabled.
Did that change it? Yep. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I see what you did. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Shane, we have a few more people trying to log in so we're getting them uh yep no problem the right code here looks like there's about 30 people with us now so those of you that are with us we'll be going here in a minute or two Anyway, we have a few more people just adding in here, so please be stand by. We'll get started here in a couple minutes. Uh, looks like uh, some of you may have to do this manually, so um, we'll get you guys all in here and ready to go here in a couple minutes. Shane, thanks for your patience. No problem. few things that go fixing on the other end here so bear with us here we'll get started 
in a few minutes. Looks like uh, we have a few more people trying to get in, and it looks like some of you uh, got in and had to put it in manually. So I appreciate your patience. It looks like the link was uh, was sent out was not working as well. And we're going to get started here in about two minutes for those of you that are with us. Um, we just got a few more people to get in here manually and then uh, we'll get started. Shane, thanks again for your patience. Jane, normally we talk about, um, you know, how clear it is here in Sun River and we can go out and do all this viewing and, you know, with the moon and Jupiter and Saturn being out there, it's, um, it's at least it's cloudy from our, our point of view right now. So I don't yeah, feel- we're supposed to get three inches of snow tomorrow, so it's not clear here either. <laughs> oh, okay. Are you guys going to do anything for the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn? So the the uh, the Adler uh, Adler Planetarium, which is here in Chicago, they have these uh, kind of online live astronomy events every week, uh, and so I assume they're going to they're going to tell us all about it and tell us how to go out in our backyards and look at it. So, yeah, hopefully we can do that live here if we uh, get clear skies and get clearance from our um, powers that be to open up again. So, yeah, nice. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I saw Jupiter and Saturn in the same. I know, right? It's been a long time. <laughs> I have to look that one up. I don't know how long that's been. Well, I think um, that's about 10 after. I think we might want to get started here. It looks like we got okay. a few people that added in. So I'll turn this over to you, Shane, and we'll get rolling along. Okay. Well, great. Uh, welcome tonight, everyone. Uh, it's certainly good to uh, see you all. Um, it's great to be back at Sun River, if only virtually. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Eastern Oregon, so I grew up in Oregon. Uh, but I, I got to come visit the observatory in the summer of 2019, uh, in the before time. And I told you all a little bit uh, about, uh, I can't even remember what I talked about, black holes or gravitational waves or something, I'm sure. Uh, but Bob asked if I'd be willing to come and do a virtual talk tonight. So uh, I'm here to visit you again. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy is a kind of favorite topic of mine to talk with people about 
both because it's one of the kind of exotic things in the night sky that people can see. It's something unusual, particularly for people who have grown up in cities. They're not used to seeing the Milky Way, but those of us who grew up in the dark skies in the West, we've certainly seen the Milky Way many times. Uh, but it's also an important object in terms of professional astrophysics. It's at, uh, for many questions, at the forefront of modern astrophysical research. And in fact, my personal research, the stuff that a lot of the students in my group work on um, is related to the Milky Way galaxy. So I'll tell you just a little bit about that tonight as well. So in the background behind me here, you see what uh, most of us will recognize as the Milky Way galaxy. If you say the Milky Way galaxy to someone, this is the picture that pops up in your head. But of course, this view of the Milky Way is one that no human has ever had, and certainly one that no human ever will have, because in order to see the galaxy this way, you would have to be able to travel outside the Milky Way and in fact, above the Milky Way. We live down inside the Milky Way, down in this blue part that you see down here. And in order to see this, you would have to travel outside. And so, of course, you and I live in the future. And so we have uh, really great friends who are artists and digital artists. And we have exquisite astronomical data that we didn't have even 10, 50 years ago. And we've taken and melded all of that information together. And we are now able to produce pictures that look like this that represent as accurately as our knowledge lets us what the Milky Way would look like if we could stand outside and look at it. Uh, when I was growing up and first learning about astronomy, you would often get pictures like this of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a nearby galaxy to the Milky Way, and we'll talk about it a little tonight. And people would point to the Andromeda Galaxy picture and say, this is what the Milky Way might look like if you could see it from outside. But of course, today we merge all our technology and all our art together, and you can get these kind of very exquisite and very beautiful pictures that aren't real, but they're as close to reality as we can get. Okay, so keep that in mind. So let me go ahead and start some slides for you. So as we go along, so in this particular Zoom format, you'll see a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen called Q&A. So as we go along, you're not allowed to speak because you're all attendees, but if you have questions, put them into the Q&A, go ahead and type them in. And when we get to the end of the talk, there'll be some time uh, to answer questions. And Bob and I'll read through the uh, list of questions that we get um, and answer as many of them as we can. You'll be able to type them in at the end as well. But if they spark your interest along the way, just uh, dump them over there in the Q&A and then we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Okay, so let me start a couple of slides here. Uh, you see my slides there, Bob? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I call this talk a living history of the Milky Way. And one of the reasons I use that title is because um, the history of how we've come to understand the Milky Way is actually quite short. We've, we'll, we'll start maybe 400 years ago where we first began to understand it, but all of the things that you think you know or that you think you've been taught about the Milky Way have really been learned only in the last 100, 120, 130 years. So within the lifetime of myself and my great grandmother, um, we've learned virtually everything about the Milky Way that you might learn or read in a book. Okay, so I call this a living history of the Milky Way because this is, this is kind of the forefront of astronomical knowledge. We're learning this within lifetimes that you and I have experienced. Uh, my social media contacts are there. You can certainly follow me on Twitter. My email address and my blog link are there. Um, you can certainly go read at my blog about uh, all sorts of different astronomy things, but there's a little bit there about the Milky Way work that we do. Um, as well. And if you have questions uh, in the future, you should certainly send me an email there. Uh, that's my Northwestern email address. And uh, certainly uh, I'll do my best to help you find the answers to whatever questions you have. Okay. So this is uh, another, a different artist rendition of the Milky Way, a slightly different view. It is as if you were looking straight down on top of the Milky Way. As we'll discuss a little bit here deeper into the talk, the Milky Way is actually more or less shaped like a giant flat pancake. So it looks like a big circle when you uh, look down on it from the top. It has some very exquisite structure, what we call the spiral arms. Those are the large overdense blue and red regions that you see there. That's where most of the stars are. That's where most of the star formation, the birth of stars is happening. Those red areas are molecular clouds of gas and dust where new stars are born. 
And then it has this kind of bright yellowish center that's uh, kind of bar shaped. That bar shape is something that we've seen in other galaxies and we've recently been able to measure in the Milky Way as well. Uh, but that central region is, is called the bulge and it is kind of ball shaped. So if you took a ping pong ball and you stuck it in the middle of your pancake, uh, you would have a pretty good approximation to what the Milky Way actually looks like uh, in terms of its structure. The sun lives all the way out here in an area called the Carina Cygnus arm. And everything I'm about to tell you, we have learned from looking at the Milky Way, living out there in that one spot in the galaxy where the sun is located, buried in the pancake, never able to go above or below or to travel anywhere else in the galaxy. And that's one of the remarkable things about astronomy in general, but in terms of the study of the Milky Way in particular, almost everything that we know we've learned from sitting right here on Earth. We can't go out to the distant places in the universe and visit them and measure them directly with our instruments. All we can do is sit here on Earth with our telescopes, our many different telescopes of different types, and learn what we can from the light that makes it across the cosmos to our location here at the sun. And so in many ways, the things that we know about the Milky Way are really the things that we can understand defined by the questions that we know how to ask. And as a consequence of those questions, the questions we can answer from experiments or observations that we can make. Okay, so as we go through the talk tonight, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna posit just a couple of questions. There are of course an infinite number of questions we could ask about the Milky Way, but I'll posit just a couple of questions that we have asked over the history as we've come to understand the Milky Way. And I'll use those to kind of frame this story about how we've come to our present understanding, okay? So the beginning place is the kind of thing you can experience there in Sun River if you walk out on a dark night. And right now the face of the moon is favorable for this, although the weather may not be, it sounds like. Uh, but if you go out at night uh, when it's dark and clear, particularly in the summer, so this picture is uh, kind of in the fall and summertime, you can see the Milky Way arching overhead. And for all of human history, until the current modern age when city lighting has become more prominent. This is the view of the Milky Way that we and our ancestors have had. It has always been there in the sky. It is a faint diaphanous cloud that stretches from one sky to the other, is brighter in some places than others, is darker in some places than others. It looks like a cloud. It doesn't look like anything different than that. And so we didn't know what it was. And so there are plenty of mythological stories that describe it uh, from uh, in virtually every culture in the world, uh, but it has always been a feature in the night sky, the same way the constellations are or the wandering stars, the planets are or so on, okay? So the first obvious question to ask then is what is the Milky Way? Certainly the mythological stories that told us about the Milky Way, they were trying to answer that. What is it? Why is it there? Where did it come from? But the scientific question, what is the Milky Way, was only able to be answered once we invented a piece of technology. And as many of you might guess, that piece of technology was the astronomical telescope. In 1609, Galileo was the first person to take a telescope and turn it to the sky. And he discovered many things in that first year with the simple aid of a small telescope, a telescope that literally is no better than the pair of birding binoculars you have under the front seat of your car. With just a little bit of aid, your eye can discern tremendous amounts uh, about the universe that you can't see with your naked eye. And the nature of the Milky Way is one of those things. Galileo was the first person to use a telescope to look at the Milky Way, what used to just be a faint cloud, and was able to discern what it was all about. In a very real way, he made the galaxy what it is for us today. Okay, and so let me quote to you what he wrote. So in 1610, he wrote a book about all of the things he had discovered the previous year with his telescope. That book is called Sidereus Nuncius. It's written in Latin. If you have the uh, opportunity to see them, there are many copies still in existence. Uh, we have one in, uh, here in Chicago at the Adler Planetarium if you come visit us. Uh, but you can also find it translated into English because it is arguably uh, one of the most important books in the history of astronomy. And this is what he wrote about the Milky Way. He said, the galaxy is nothing else 
than a congeries of innumerable stars distributed in clusters. Congeries means gathering or clustering of stars. To whatever region of the Milky Way you direct your spyglass, an immense number of stars immediately offer themselves to view, of which very many appear rather large and very conspicuous, they're bright, but the multitude of small ones is truly unfathomable. So this is what Galileo discovered. He looked at what looks to your eye like a cloud and he discovered that what it is, is the light from an almost uncountable number of pinpoints of light too faint to see without the aid of the telescope. And the bit of emphasis in yellow there that I've added is my own emphasis, because I think this is actually what's really important. Galileo immediately realized that the Milky Way was composed of stars, okay? But he knew that the number of naked eye stars in the sky is a finite number. It's about 9,000 if you can reach both hemispheres of the planet, okay? But he recognized almost immediately that with the aid of his telescope, there were far too many for him to actually count, okay? And so today we know there are something on the order of 400 billion individual stars that make up what you and I call the Milky Way. The faint diaphanous glow of the Milky Way in the sky is just the light of 400 billion stars showering down on you every night when you go out in your backyard, okay? So this is where it stood for a long time. Telescope technology improved. Uh, people began building them. They became more common. Uh, in uh, this age in Europe, they kind of became drawing room curiosities. So people would collect them and have them uh, at dinner parties, just like now when you go over to your amateur astronomy friend's house, they take you out in the backyard and show you stuff through the telescope. It was the same thing in this era as telescopes were becoming popular. And so our understanding of the Milky Way, we certainly were discovering things in the sky and trying to figure out what they all were. But the Milky Way itself, our understanding, didn't really change very much for almost another 170 years or so. And in 1785, William and Carolyn Herschel decided they were going to map the Milky Way. They could see the Milky Way just like you could if you go out in your backyard. They could use their telescopes, which were growing ever increasingly larger uh, for the Herschels, and they could see exactly what Galileo saw. They could see that there were lots and lots and lots of stars that they could count. And so that's what they decided to do. They decided that they could use the stars they could see in the telescope and they could count them and somehow use that to map out the shape and extent of the Milky Way galaxy for the first time. Okay, so the technique they used is something called star gauges. And I'm gonna tell you about star gauges here for a minute. Uh, because uh, uh, paper lives for very long times, so we still have the original paper that they wrote about it. And through the magic of the internet, you can certainly get it. Uh, the uh, papers of the Royal Society where Herschel's published their result um, is available. So you see there a paper from 1785. You can go get it and read it yourself. Uh, but this paper I've linked to there underneath it is actually a modern paper that describes in kind of more detail uh, what I'm about to tell you about star gauges. For, so for those of you who are kind of uh, technically oriented uh, in amateur astronomy, you may find that archived paper there at the bottom interesting. So let me tell you how star gauges work. So the fundamental problem in astronomy is that we absolutely cannot measure distances well. Measuring distances is the hardest problem in astronomy. And with stars, the problem is complicated because stars uh, appear a certain brightness to you here on Earth. And the brightness they have depends on two things. One, how intrinsically bright is it? Right, so stars are kind of like light bulbs. If you have a 100 watt light bulb and a 40 watt light bulb, the 100 watt light bulb is brighter, okay? The 100 watt light bulb is intrinsically brighter than the 40 watt light bulb. It gives off more energy. But the brightness of stars is also affected by their distance from the earth when viewed, okay? So I've set this up in my backyard with two flashlights to show you. So, um, the two flashlights here in the image as you see them are exactly the same distance away from the camera. Okay, and they're both the same model flashlight. So in principle, they're exactly the same brightness. 
And so this is what the Herschels assumed. They said, we don't know how many 100 watt light bulbs, how many 20 watt light bulbs, how many 40 watt light bulbs there are in the sky. So let's just assume they're all exactly the same. Let's assume every star is a 100 watt light bulb, okay? So then if they're all the same distance away, they would appear to be the same brightness in the telescope. But if one star were farther away, then it would get dimmer. And if one star was closer, it would get brighter. So here I've taken the two flashlights that I have and the one on the left, I've just walked closer to the camera. And in the context of a picture, the way you can tell it's brighter is it's more overexposed. The exposure is larger. Similarly, if I take that same uh, flashlight and I walk farther away from the camera, it gets dimmer. Okay, and so this is the basic tool that the Herschels were using. They're saying, if all stars are the same brightness and I look at them in my telescope, then the dim ones are farther away and the bright ones are closer. That's the whole principle of their mapping. It's not perfect, but it's the sort of thing we have to do in astronomy. When we don't know how to do something right, we do something that is close or good enough, and then we write down what we discover. And then we, it's obligated to us to say, look, I made this assumption that all stars are the same brightness. I know that's not right. And if you figure out a way to tell the brightness apart, then you can take my experiment and do a bit a bigger one. Okay, so the Herschels did the first one by just assuming they're all the same brightness. They accomplished this with the famous 40 foot telescope. So uh, in those days, uh, telescopes were described by their focal length, that is how far it is from one end of the telescope to the other. Okay, so this is the famous 40 foot. In modern parlance, we would call this a 48 inch telescope. The diameter of the mirror was four feet across. And so the mirror is down on the bottom uh, left of the structure, down here where you see this hut. Uh, and the observer, Herschel typically, would stand here in this uh, cage that's at the upper end. There was a little eyepiece mounted on the rim of the telescope and he would look through the eyepiece and the light would come from over his shoulder hit the mirror down at the bottom and reflect up to the eyepiece on the end, okay? And so the way this worked is he would point the telescope in one direction in the sky. He would count all the stars of different brightnesses that he could see in that direction and they would record the number, okay? So they'd say, I see 25 dim ones, uh, 37 even more dim ones, 20 bright ones and four super bright ones. Okay, and so they'd write all the information down in 683 different directions in the sky. Okay, and the result is the very first map of the Milky Way ever made. Okay, so right there in the center, uh, there's one kind of bigger star, that's the sun. And so you can see in any given direction, so let's just go straight up from the sun, there are maybe 10 or 15 stars in that direction. And so each dot represents, uh, I should remember the number, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I don't remember how many it is, but it's some big number of stars. It's like 100 stars or something like that. Okay, and so there were, each dot close to you is 100 really bright stars. Each dot a little bit farther away are a little bit dimmer stars, a little farther away even dimmer stars, and so on, until the stars get so dim or equivalently so far away that you couldn't see stars anymore. And if you do that in the 600 different directions from the sun, the Milky Way resolves itself into something that doesn't look unfamiliar. It looks like a big flattened distribution of stars. If you're an amateur astronomer, you will recognize on the uh, left-hand side of the image there, a kind of a long crocodile-shaped space. Okay, that's a known dark region in the Milky Way that you can see in the summertime called the Cygnus Rift. It goes right through the middle of the constellation Cygnus. And it shows up exquisitely in the Herschel's map right here. We know today that that's gas and dust blocking the view of stars behind us. So what did Herschel write about this? What Herschel wrote is he said, the Milky Way is a very extensive branching compound conjuries, that clustering word again, of many millions of stars, right? So Herschel had figured out a number that he thinks associated with the galaxy and it's huge, millions of stars, which most probably owes its origin to the many remarkably large, as well as pretty closely scattered small stars that may have drawn together the rest. 
Okay. And I emphasize that yellow bit here again on my own because I think that's important. This was done in 1785, which is just about 100 years after Newton first published the Principia, which was the very first publication of today, what we call the universal law of gravitation. The Principia contains the first theoretical description of our understanding of how gravity works. And once you write down that physical law, that mathematical description, what you discover is that there's nothing that says it should only apply to say stars and planets. Gravity must function the same everywhere. And what's remarkable to me is that in less than a hundred years, that idea pervaded the scientific community. And here you already see Herschel recognizing that the thing that's holding the Milky Way together is the gravity of the Milky Way itself. Okay, and that's less than a hundred years after Newton first published the universal law of gravitation, okay? Okay, so there at the center is where Herschel thought the sun was. And based on his observations, you can see it's very close to the center there. But this is an obvious question. Where is the sun in the galaxy? Now I marked it at the beginning of the talk about two thirds out from the center of the galaxy. And the question is, how did we figure that out? Well, as I've said, figuring that out is really hard because the hardest problem in astronomy is measuring distances. Herschel made his map by making an assumption about the stars so that he could use something he could measure, the brightness of the stars, to tell him something about something he couldn't measure, the distances to them. But ultimately, if we want to make an accurate map, we have to solve this problem better. We have to find a way to measure the distances to the stars more effectively and accurately. Okay, and so this problem vexed astronomers for decades, for hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, it wasn't solved until the 1900s. And it was solved by this woman. This is Henrietta Swan Leavitt. So Leavitt was one of the group of women who worked at the Harvard College Observatory in the early 1900s. They're usually called the Harvard Computers. Okay, as a more remarkable group of women, all of them were trained in astronomy, mathematics, physics, chemistry. Uh, Leavitt was the first uh, woman to get a degree in astronomy from Ratliff, uh, Ratcliffe College, which was the women's college at Harvard at that time. And uh, she went to work at the Harvard College Observatory and was doing all kinds of different stellar data processing because in those days, uh, observatories were becoming very prominent and common. The technology was improving, in particular photography was being added to telescopes. And so data was being collected at a prodigious rate. And so the women of the Harvard computers were all responsible for analyzing that data. And as a consequence, in just that kind of 20-ish year time span where they were all involved there at the Harvard College Observatory, their work literally transformed astronomy. But if people ask me what was the most important discovery ever in astronomy, I would tell you it's Henrietta Swan Leavitt's discovery of how to measure the distances to the stars. Because measuring distances is the hardest problem in astronomy, still today, okay? But she's the one who cracked the code. And in 1908, she was looking at data for a galaxy that's actually near to the Milky Way called the Large Magellanic Cloud. And there's a group of stars in that galaxy called Cepheids that kind of get brighter and dimmer with time. Okay, and I won't go into all the technical details. It's kind of a whole talk into itself as to how she solved the puzzle. But what she found out, what she discovered was that if you watch how those stars vary in brightness over time, so you look at them right now, you wait an hour and they're brighter. You wait another hour, they're brighter. You wait another hour and they're getting dim. And then they get dim and then they get bright and then they get dim and then they get bright and then they get dim. We call that a light curve. And what she discovered is the brightest stars get brighter and dimmer on a different time scale than the dimmer stars. Dimmer stars get brighter and dimmer slower and bright stars get brighter and dimmer quicker. And so if you want to measure the actual intrinsic property of the star, if you want to read the wattage off the star, all you have to do is sit there with a the stopwatch and time how long it takes to get bright and dim. And we call that Leavitt's Law. 
Okay, if you time how long it takes a star to get bright and dim, you can measure the brightness of that star. And as a consequence of that, determine its correct distance. Those of you who have been uh, taught some astronomy, that you know uh, the mathematical relationship for this. Um, it's usually called the Cepheid period luminosity relationship. Okay, but this is Leibovitz's law. She's the one who figured it out in 1908. And the moment she figured it out, astronomers realized they could use it to start solving problems in astronomy. Okay, and so uh, there are many things that happened almost immediately within the first three or four years after she published the law. But specifically with the Milky Way, I want to jump about 10 years after her discovery. Okay, so this is Harlow Shapley. So in 1918, Shapley was the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory, which at that time had the largest telescope in the world on Mount Wilson uh, over Pasadena in California. And so Shapley was interested in the globular cluster. So this is a picture of a globular cluster called NGC 6388. It is uh, all globular clusters are collections of kind of 100,000, half a million stars, all very tightly packed together, so close together that their gravity keeps all the stars together in this ball-shaped region of space that we call a globular cluster. Okay, and so Shapley uh, was very interested in these. There's about 150 of them known around the Milky Way. And he really desperately wanted to know how far away they all were. And he immediately recognized that he could use Leibovitz's law to measure the distances to the globular clusters and map out where they all were in relation to the Milky Way. Okay, so let me show you his map, okay? So this is a two-dimensional plot, the kind you probably remember from making when you took science class uh, the last time you were in the science class. Okay, so this is looking down on top of the Milky Way, like those kind of uh, pictures I showed you right at the beginning. And so if I just to plot the shadow of where all of the globular clusters are in that looking down from the top of the Milky Way, there's a globular cluster at each one of those green dots. Now, Shapley, just like Herschel, knew that all the gravity in this part of the universe is due to the Milky Way, which means the globular clusters respond to the gravity of the Milky Way. So wherever the center of all the globular clusters is must be for all the gravity, the center of the Milky Way is concentrated. And that's at the red X in that diagram. The sun, by contrast, is located over there where the yellow star is, okay? So this is a reasonable assumption that the Milky Way is responsible for the gravity of the globular clusters. And so they're not centered on the sun, they're centered on the Milky Way. And so the distance between the sun and that red X then is the location of the sun in the Milky Way galaxy. So if I go back to our original picture, this is how we know the sun is about two thirds out from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the Milky Way. Now, other people were doing exactly the same sorts of things that Shapley was doing. He was measuring the distances to the globular clusters, but they were actually also measuring distances across the Milky Way to get an understanding of what the size of this thing actually is. And they had figured out that the Milky Way is a hundred thousand light years from one side to the other. If you and I could travel at the speed of light, it would take us a hundred thousand years, 20 times longer than recorded human history to get from one side of the Milky Way all the way to the other. Now this light year that we use in astronomy, we use because it helps make the numbers easier to handle. Okay, 100,000 is a number that's easy to say, easy to write down, easy to mathematically manipulate. But if I use conventional numbers that you and I are used to, like miles, that 100,000 light years is actually 588 quadrillion miles across. Okay, and quadrillion, I can't even remember how many zeros that is. It's like 18 zeros, I think, something like that. Okay, so the Milky Way is enormous and the ability to measure distances made us finally understand how vast the galaxy actually is, okay? Before that time, we had no idea. 
So the obvious question then is, okay, well, is the Milky Way the only galaxy? So that's an interesting question. Today, it sounds like it's kind of a silly question because of course there's other galaxies. We know there's other galaxies. I go out in my backyard with my telescope and I look at other galaxies all the time. I read about other galaxies in the news, okay? But literally a hundred years ago, we didn't know the answer to this question. We had no idea. And in fact, astronomers were completely confused by this question. They debated this vigorously. This was the frontier question in astrophysics in the year 1920, okay? So why was that? Well, in the olden days, when you looked through telescopes, it was kind of like looking through a telescope in your backyard. Everything looks like a dim, fuzzy, white thing. And those of you who are amateur astronomers, you recognize that everything looks kind of faint and cloudy in the telescope. Those of you who are astronomy spouses and get dragged out to look through telescopes, you think everything looks like a dim, fuzzy white blob. And they do, okay? So here is the perfect kind of example comparison. On the left is an object called Centaurus A. It looks like a dim, fuzzy white blob with a dark band through the middle of it. On the right is an object called the Trifid Nebula which looks like a dim fuzzy white blob with some dark lanes going through the middle of it. These two things look extraordinarily similar in the telescope. And so a hundred years ago, we called all of these things nebulae. We didn't distinguish between galaxies and nebulae. We called them all nebulae because they all look like clouds. Nebulae is Latin for cloud, okay? So what caused astronomers to start asking the question, are these things all really nebulae or not? Are they different? Well, the, the uh, debate was incited by the construction of a big telescope. So in 1845, uh, William Parsons built this enormous telescope, which is called the Leviathan of Parsonstown. So you can see this telescope was about six feet in diameter. You can see a person standing there in the end of the telescope. But it was so large and so heavy, it had to be supported by a castle wall. Okay, so they could haul the telescope up and down along the castle wall, but then they had to sit there and just wait for things in the sky to drift past. They couldn't actually steer it and point it the way we do with modern telescopes. Okay, and so he used this telescope to look at what was then called the Whirlpool Nebula, what today we call the Whirlpool Galaxy. And he saw something no one had ever seen before that made him, for reasons that I still don't understand, suggest that this object was actually another galaxy, what in those days they called island universes, okay? So let me show you his sketch. In 1872, he looked at what we call M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy but this was called the Whirlpool Nebula then. And you can see the exquisite spiral structure in that galaxy. The first time spiral structure had ever been detected in another galaxy, okay? You can see this today if, you're, uh, if you have a large enough telescope or your amateur astronomer friends have a large enough telescope, you can see this structure from your backyard, okay? So he immediately said, this must be another galaxy. And this sent astronomers off the deep end, okay? Half the astronomers in the world thought, he's right. There are totally galaxies somewhere else in the universe. And other astronomers, the other half of the astronomical community said, that is totally bonkers. The entire universe is just the Milky Way. All these things you think are other galaxies are just things inside the Milky Way. The universe can't possibly be bigger than the Milky Way is itself, okay? So this was 1872, this debate started. And in 1920, it was still going on. Okay, so astronomers were really perplexed by this. They argued about it. They took all the kinds of uh, observations and data they could, but they couldn't answer the question. Okay, and, and the reason was their data just wasn't good enough. There was no absolutely confirming data that everyone could agree on. There were observations that were in conflict with each other. There were ideas that were in conflict with each other. There were kind of data that was kind of on the edge of being good and some data that wasn't good at all. There were just all kinds of reasons why it didn't work out. And so astronomers, I mean, this is what we thrive on in science. We thrive on not understanding stuff. And we go think about clever things to do and we design new experiments and then we get together and we argue with each other and then we go have beer and pizza when we're done, okay? So in 1920, they had a great debate. This is called the great debate or the Shapley-Curtis debate, as you see it called here. 
uh, in April at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. So what did they do? They brought all the scientists to the Smithsonian and for a day, they spent the whole day arguing about these two different viewpoints, okay? And at the end of the day, they had a public lecture for the general public to show up, to come listen to what scientists were trying to understand, to understand the problems that scientists were struggling with and to recognize that this is part of the endeavor to try and understand the cosmos around us. And so that debate, that public lecture debate was held by these two gentlemen here. So on the left, you will recognize our old friend, Harlow Shapley, who was the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory. He was probably one of the most widely recognized uh, authoritative astronomy figures in the United States at the time. Uh, and on the right is Heber Curtis. So Heber was the director of the Allegheny Observatory, which then was in the foothills over Pittsburgh. It is now no longer there. Okay, but Heber was also a recognized authority in his own right. Shapley was firmly in the group of people who believed the Milky Way was the entire universe. A hundred thousand light years was an enormous, a mind-bogglingly huge distance. And people just simply couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that the universe could be bigger than that. Curtis, on the other hand, represented the other group. And there were lots of observations which set apart these spiral nebulae that made them different than the other nebulae they could see. And that is really what they were talking about. They're like these observations that we observe, uh, these, these observations that we've made about the spiral nebulae clearly suggest they're not a part of the Milky Way because they don't have the same properties as everything else in the Milky Way. Okay, and so they debated this, but in the end, virtually no one changed their mind. The camp on one side and the camp on the other side, they all went home firmly convinced they were still right because the other astronomers hadn't presented any new overwhelmingly convincing data. We needed better observations. We needed better experiments. And of course, the, what we actually needed was we needed to measure the distance to the spiral nebulae. And measuring the distance is the hardest problem in astronomy. But fortunately for us, that problem has been solved by Henrietta Swan Leavitt in 1908, okay? She taught us how to measure the distances to other stars in the universe. And so if the spiral nebulae were in the Milky Way or outside the Milky Way, all we really had to do was to measure the distance to a star that we knew was associated with the spiral nebula and we could measure the distance. And so that's what astronomers set out to do. And the person who finally did it was this gentleman. This is uh, a person you will recognize. This is Edwin Hubble. And in 1924, he was using the telescope at Mount Wilson to observe the nearby, what was then called Andromeda Nebula. Okay, so he was observing the Andromeda Nebula, trying to measure one of Leavitt's stars in the Andromeda Nebula so he could measure the distance to it. Okay, so those of you who are amateur astronomers know you can see this in the constellation Andromeda. Uh, so if you just go out, even with a pair of binoculars, or if it's dark enough where you live, you can certainly see it with your naked eye. But this is the object that solved the puzzle for us. Okay, so this is a picture of Hubble's frame, his plate, that he took of the Andromeda Nebula. And so you'll notice up there in the upper right corner, those two little black lines. And you probably can't see it on the computer, but if you go look at the uh, scan of the original plate, you'll see there's a dot between those two lines, okay? So that's Hubble taking a Sharpie or whatever the 1924 equivalent of a Sharpie is and marking an object that he saw on his plate. And you'll see he originally wrote the letter N next to it, okay? So N means Nova. So nova is a particular kind of astronomical event we see. It's not a supernova. It's kind of related, but it's an explosive event where a star collects some, um, some matter on its surface, and then the nuclear burning takes off, and it kind of blows the surface off and makes a very bright star. Okay, They're typically not recurring. They're typically single events. But when he first took this picture, he thought it was a nova, and he marked it in. You can see some other nova on the same plate. But you'll see at some point later, he went back and he crossed out N and he wrote VAR, which means he recognized this was one of Leavitt's variable stars. 
he was taking picture after picture after picture of the Andromeda galaxy and comparing the pictures. And what he realized is that was not a nova getting bright. It was one of the variable stars being bright and then getting dim again. And then he saw it get bright again. And once he recognized it as one of Leavitt's stars, he used Leavitt's law to compute the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and showed uh, the number he got then, I think, is something like 1.5 million light years away, clearly outside the 100,000 light year bounds of the Milky Way. So just five years, four years after the great debate, a single observation completely collapsed the argument in the astronomical community. Everyone agrees, and they could do this themselves if they had a big enough telescope, that indeed the spiral nebulae are galaxies elsewhere in the universe. And so once you recognize that the Milky Way is just one of many galaxies, then the game becomes very different because you can start looking at other galaxies and looking at their shape, looking at their structure, looking at their compositions and using that information to infer things about your own Milky Way that you actually live in. And so this was the beginning of the march towards our modern understanding of the Milky Way. This, this ability to actually accurately map the size of the Milky Way and the distances to other galaxies, okay? Okay, so let me just take my last few minutes and tell you about what my group does. So this is, uh, this is my group here at Northwestern. Uh, so these are all students who are doing their work with me. There is a range of PhD students, a couple of them there in the upper left, uh, Katie and Michael, uh, who already have their PhD, uh, but the rest of them are all kind of on their way to getting their uh, degrees, or some of them are undergraduates and high school students who have worked with me. My faculty colleagues that I work with are across the top there. Uh, Vicki uh, is here at Northwestern with me, uh, but Matt, Brett, and Patty are all at other institutions, and my cat, of course, is always in the picture as well. <laughs> so uh, she's swirling around at my feet right now, wondering what I'm doing talking to all of you here late at night. So what do we work on in my group? So we work actually on something called gravitational waves. So I work on a space mission called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. Uh, it will be three satellites, which you see there, uh, that are free flying. They will follow the Earth around in its orbit, and they will shine lasers back and forth between the three satellites to measure gravitational waves that propagate through the galaxy, uh, propagate through the solar system. Now, the reason this is of interest to us is because one of the primary sources of gravitational waves for LISA is the Milky Way. The Milky Way is full of about 10 million dead white dwarf stars, which are all emitting gravitational waves that LISA are sensitive to. So what my group does is we simulate the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way. We simulate all of those white dwarfs uh, in anticipation of estimating, predicting, uh, figuring out what it is that Lisa will measure and be able to tell us about the Milky Way. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how we do that and then we'll call it an evening here. So, oh, this is what Lisa looks like if you build it out of Lego. I also build lots of Lego stuff. So what do we do to simulate galaxies? So to simulate galaxies, what you have to do is you have to have a way of building a galaxy in the computer that accurately represents the real galaxy. Okay, so we have a technical name for that. We call that population synthesis. Okay, and the way we do it is to learn what are all the rules that govern how stars learn their lives, uh, lead their lives. Then we teach the computer those rules. We have it birth a star, evolve the star through its life, and then tell me what are its properties today after it's died and become a white dwarf. Okay, so one way you can understand how we do that is you can imagine I wanted to do that by simulating the audience that's listening to this talk tonight. Okay, so if we were face to face, it would be easier because I could point at all of you, but you could imagine that the audience is composed of a whole bunch of people at different stages in their lives. Some of you are old folks, some of you are middle-aged folks, some of you are grown-ups, some of you are college kids, and some of you are still in elementary and high school. Okay, so if I were to count you up by your ages, this gives me some kind of representation of, in the context of people who attend astronomy talks, how many of you are old, middle-aged, grown-ups, college kids, or, or elementary and high school kids. 
Okay. And the, that distribution is always kind of the same, right? It's always the same fraction, the same percentage of people whenever you do this experiment with every audience who listens to an astronomy talk. So I can take that information, I can take those percentages and simulate populations on the computer. And so this is one way you might do it. You can imagine I were to simulate an audience of 3,000 people instead of just an audience of 80 people. And if I did that, but I obeyed the percentages, then these might be what those simulations look like. In one simulation, I might have 368 old folks, and they'd be sitting in different places in the audience. But in another simulation, I might have a slightly different number, 354, and they're sitting in some other places in the audience. Okay? But in the end, the percentages, the things that tell me that this is an astronomy audience, looks kind of the same. So this is what we do on the computer. We just do it with stars instead of people. We just need to know what are the rules for how stars live their lives that divide them up into old stars, middle-aged stars, grown-up stars, college-age stars, and kid stars. Okay, And there are rules that we understand that do that. They are rules like when a star is born, it has a certain amount of stuff in it, and that affects how it lives its life. So how many stars are born with each of the different sizes, each of the different masses they could have? If the star is born with a companion, a twin, they lead very different lives than if they're born all by themselves or if they're born in a triple, okay? Where the star was born affects it. We have different star formation in the arms of the galaxy, these kind of blue and pinkish arms that you see in the pictures, than we do in the yellow bulge center of the galaxy, right? So all of these rules we can put together in the computer and it will simulate what the Milky Way looks like. And the way we check if we did it right or not is we go out the back door and we look at the Milky Way and we compare it to what we can see. And if we can get the stellar population right, if we can get it to look like the real Milky Way, then we assume the stellar graveyard, what my group is interested in, is also right. Okay? So let me show you some movies of the stellar graveyard and then we'll, we'll be done. So these are two different simulations that we've done in my group. They're kind of rotating, so hopefully they're not uh, jittering too much uh, for you on your end there. But if you look at the one on the left, and you look at the one on, compared to the one, they're kind of the same, but they're slightly different shapes. Okay, so one is a little bit fatter in the middle, and one is a little bit thinner in the middle. And that has to do with the properties of this yellow bulge that we see in the center of the Milky Way. We don't necessarily have good understanding of everything that goes on. We've made some measurements, and some of them suggest it behaves one way. We've made other measurements, and some of them suggest they behave the other way. Okay, so this is just like astronomers in the 1920s. They have observations and they can't decide what the right answer is. Okay, but if we can simulate the stellar graveyard and then we can measure the stellar graveyard with the Milky Way, what this simulation shows you is we can tell the difference between the two ideas about what might be happening in the bulge of the Milky Way. This is why looking at the universe in different ways with different telescopes, but with different technology, with gravitational wave technology, instead of normal telescopes, can teach us so much about the universe because it sees the galaxy in a new and different way. And we can learn about it by being able to see it in a different way. Here's another simulation of the uh, view of the Milky Way zooming out from the sun. So as you zoom out from the sun, which was the yellow dot you see there, you'll see dots appearing slowly but surely. Okay, and when we get far out, you'll see that Lisa will see the entire Milky Way in gravitational waves. You can see it has the big disk shape that you're used to, and then you can see the bulge there in the center. Okay, and the thing you should notice, I don't know if you can quite see it on uh, whatever device you're watching on, but there's uh, a group of the stars that are red, and there's a group of the stars that are purple, and then there's a few black dots. The purple and black dots are stars that we can see with LISA in gravitational waves, but we can also see with telescopes, okay? And so those stars are extraordinarily important because if you can measure them both with gravitational waves and with telescopes, 
you can learn even more about the life processes that led to that point in the stellar graveyard. And so this is probably the most exciting thing about the potential for LISA is this group of stars that we can see both with telescopes and with gravitational waves. And the black dots that you see there uh, in the movie uh, that are over the purple ones, if I scroll it back there. So this group of black dots, those are, those are uh, stars we already can see in telescopes, but we're still building LISA, so we haven't seen them in gravitational waves yet. But all of the purple ones are the ones from one of our simulations that we should be able to see with both. Okay, so this is, you probably, those of you who pay attention to gravitational waves have heard of something called multi-messenger astronomy, which is seeing something in both telescopes and gravitational waves, and that will be true for LISA as well. Okay, okay, well that's where I'm going to end. Um, you know, our understanding of the Milky Way is uh, changing constantly, and it changes with our ability to observe. It started with a pair of, uh, with a telescope that was basically as good as a pair of binoculars. It was enhanced by ever bigger telescopes and bigger telescopes. And today it's being transformed or will be transformed by technology that isn't even a telescope at all. It's seeing the galaxy in a different way. Um, what we can understand is always about what questions you can ask. And so if you can ask a question, you should always ask it because you never know what clever device or what clever way astronomers and engineers can do to answer that question if they only knew someone was interested in that question. So this is a big part of what we do as astronomers is we just ask whatever questions come to our mind and then we ask ourselves, well, is there any way we can answer that question or not? Sometimes there is, and sometimes there's not. And when it's not, then we still ask the question because in the future, technology changes. And we've seen that over and over again in our history of studying the Milky Way. Okay, so this is really the point, you know, I always think about this, that my great grandmother, when she was born, and I had the great privilege of knowing her before she passed away, you know, they didn't even know where the sun was in the Milky Way or how big the Milky Way was or that there were other galaxies at all. And by the time she passed away, we knew that the Milky Way was one of 100 billion other galaxies. And we knew the size of the Milky Way. And we knew where the sun was. And in just one human lifetime, um, our understanding of the galaxy has completely changed. And so if I imagine that my life started in a similarly confused state as my great grandmother's did, uh, then by the time I die, we will know a tremendous amount of different things about the Milky Way. So. Uh, I always like to leave you with a few things to read. So here's a triple of books that are very nice. Uh, the top two there, The Insider's Guide and The Owner's Workshop Manual. Those are kind of good technical uh, intro astronomy level reading books about the technical story of what we know about the Milky Way. So if you're interested in that, I certainly commend both of those to your attention. Uh, the Glass Universe by Davis Sobel is an excellent, excellent book about the Harvard computers. Uh, so you should certainly read that if you're interested in the Harvard computer story. Um, they'll talk about Henrietta Swan Leavitt in there, but also many of the uh, other Harvard computers, uh, Annie Jemkana, Wilhelmina Fleming, all of them whose names you may have heard. Uh, lastly, uh, there at the bottom uh, is a link to Herschel's paper at the uh, Royal Astronomical Society, so you can go read that if you want. Uh, there's a link to the Sierra YouTube page there. You can certainly go see some of our other public lectures about astronomy and a link to my blog uh, there as well. Okay, so I'm going to end it there and say thank you so much for your attention. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. And for as long as Bob is willing to let us go on, uh, I'm certainly happy to take questions out of the uh, Q&A window. Great, Jane, thank you so much. Let's uh, go over to the questions here. Okay. Um, let's see here. Do you want to read them out or do you want me to, Bob? Uh, I'll let you go ahead. Okay, uh, here, let me just pull them up here. Uh, okay, so, uh, so there's a question from Jim, Jim Hammond. Hey, Jim, good to see you there. Uh, Jim says, what can you tell us about the fossil galaxy recently discovered in the Milky Way? So um, I'm assuming, Jim, you're talking about there was a recent uh, observation made that towards the bulge of the Milky Way, towards this yellow region, there is a fossil remnant of stars that we think were not belong to the original Milky Way. They're from some other galaxy that had come in and collided with us. So that's, this is a really important discovery uh, because this is something we see happening in all the other, in, in, in all the other, in many other galaxies in the universe. We see galaxies colliding and merging. 
And so when we do computer simulations of the whole universe, the mergers of galaxies is a really important process that drives how galaxies grow into their current states. And so if you take a galaxy like the Milky Way, which is a big kid, and you ask how many times on average do we think a galaxy like the Milky Way eats or consumes another galaxy, the number is always large. It's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And so um, there are small galaxies that orbit the Milky Way, and we see the Milky Way slowly consuming them, tidally stripping them, as we say. But this is one of the first times where we've seen the remnants of a, ga of a galaxy that the Milky Way has already cannibalized. And so that's really interesting because it's the first time that we have some direct evidence about past mergers, and hopefully we'll be able to use that to disentangle the merger history of the Milky Way. Um, the second thing I'll say about that is for those of us who work on LISA, the merger of galaxies is actually really interesting uh, because when galaxies merge, typically their parts merge together and they become a new galaxy. Now, often we think they become uh, elliptical galaxies if the two galaxies are roughly the same size or big. But the important thing for us in the gravitational wave world is that galaxies typically all carry big black holes in their centers. Uh, and someone I see a little farther down uh, in the questions there asks, what's in the bulge at the center of the galaxy? So the bulge here in the center of the galaxy is older stars. That's why it's, it's typically this yellow star color. Uh, but it's mostly stars. But at the very center of the bulge, if I can virtually move my hand there, at the very center of the bulge, uh, there's a very bright radio source called Sagittarius A star. And what we know today, based on observations of stars orbiting that, is that it is a four million solar mass black hole. Okay, so it's a, what we call a massive black hole in astrophysics. And so when galaxies merge, their massive black holes come down towards the center. And so those two black holes find each other, they will eventually spiral together and form a single bigger black hole. And how those black holes grow is a big important question. And the, the role of galaxies merging is, uh, is a big part of that. Uh, but we'll be able to see those black hole mergers using LISA in gravitational waves, which is the, the other connection to that story there. So, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tim is asking... Ah, yeah, so Tim, Tim asked a good question. He says, is the reason that we generally observe the Milky Way in a relatively perpendicular uh, direction to the horizon is that we are looking at the pancake shape as if it were standing on its end rather than lying flat on the plate, okay? So, so the picture that I showed you right at the beginning of the Milky Way over the Tetons was coming straight up out of the horizon and then it arches overhead and down to the other sky. So if you can get a star chart, uh, if you have one or if you look one up online or your amateur astronomy friends have one, the Milky Way actually is a circle. It goes completely around the sphere of the sky if you imagine the sky is just a big black ball surrounding the earth, the Milky Way is actually a complete circle, okay? And the reason you see it tipped in your view of the sky is because the uh, arrow that you put through that, that the earth is spinning on, is not exactly aligned with that circle. So sometimes the Milky Way, when you go out at night, especially in the middle of the summer or, or fall, it comes straight up out of the southern horizon, it goes up over your head, and then comes down over uh, in the north. But at other times, if you wait long enough on any given night, but at other times of year, it's actually very low and it kind of skirts the horizon almost because of that, that kind of circular uh, circular path that follows through the sky. So it's, it's the, the, the way it appears is a function of how the Earth is oriented in space and how the Milky Way is actually oriented. The reason it always looks like a, 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 a big uh, swath, a river, is because we're in the pancake. But the tip is because the Earth is tipped with respect to that pancake. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Stephen asks... Uh, for Leavitt to do the intrinsic brightness for her calculation, she should have had knowledge of the distance to the example she studied from other sources. Is that correct? How does she know the distance of the star she studied? Yeah. So, so there's kind of two parts to that question. So the question is, how did she calibrate Leavitt's law? How did she know that uh, the brightness actually meant uh, a certain distance or not? Okay. So the two parts to that question, the first is, how did she figure it out? 
And then the second is how did we actually calibrate the modern, the modern measurement? So the first way she figured it out had to do with the fact that she was looking at all of these stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So the Large Magellanic Cloud is a satellite galaxy to the Milky Way. It's kind of outside the Milky Way and it's small compared to the Milky Way, kind of you know the size of my two fists together. And so if you look at all the stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud, it's about 50 kiloparsecs away. So that is 50, 150, 150, 50,000 light years away, okay? So at 150,000 light years, one star being a little bit farther away, 150,010 light years, isn't going to make that much difference in its brightness. So she kind of did the same thing Herschel did to make the original calibration. She said, look, all of these stars are in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And so if one is on the close side of the cloud and one is on the far side of the cloud, I can't tell the difference. That doesn't change the brightness as much as the fact that they're both 150,000 light years away. Okay, and so she was able to, that's how she calibrated it and said, look, all of the stars, all the brightnesses that I'm seeing are related to their intrinsic brightness, not to, due to the fact that one's closer or one's farther away. So that was the initial calibration. And that was the genius step that she made. She was the one who recognized that, that doing them together in the Magellanic Cloud was the solution. The actual calibration, as I think uh, you suggest in your question there, Tim, uh, or uh, Stephen, is, uh, is exactly that. You have to be able to measure the distances in two different ways to precisely calibrate the relationship. And so to do that, you need a big telescope, which big telescopes were coming online around this time. Uh, the 60-inch and the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson were constructed in the 1910s. Um, and so if you can geometrically measure the distance using something called parallax, uh, then that is how the original, um, the original measurement was calibrated. Um, curiously, there's another side note for those of you who are interested in the history of this. In the 1940s, uh, what we discovered is there are two different types of Cepheids. And so there's actually two Cepheid period uh, relationships, and that was discovered by Walter Boddy. But uh, we didn't recognize that until the 1940s or 1950s when we had observed kind of hundreds of thousands of these, these Cepheid variables. So, so there's a little bit more to that story, uh, to that story there. So uh, let's see. And then uh, let's see, who did I miss? Uh, ah, so the last question there. Steve Burkle says, where is the bulk of dark matter as viewed on the galaxy map? OK, so that's a great question. So if you look at the Milky Way here behind me, um, so well, first of all, let me, let me tell you how we know the dark matter is there. So, so those of you who have studied astronomy may know that when we do our accounting for the universe about everything that fills the universe, about 4% of the universe is stuff made out of atoms, stuff like me and you. And that includes all the stars you see in an image like this, OK? About 23% of everything that's left is what we call dark matter. And the other 73 odd percent is something called dark energy. Okay, and I have an entire another talk that someday I can give you about those three things. But dark matter was discovered first. Okay, so it was originally discovered in the 1930s by a guy named Fritz Zwicky. But the person who really kind of made us understand dark matter was a thing was Vera Rubin. Uh, and Vera Rubin and her colleagues in the 1960s were looking at galaxies like the Milky Way. They were looking at galaxies far away. And what they would do is they would measure how fast the galaxy is rotating from the center on a line out to the edge. And if Newton's universal law of gravitation is correct, and all the gravity is coming from stars, what you expect is stars to be rotating very fast, kind of in the inner part, and starts to be rotating slower out in the outer part. And what uh, Rubin and her uh, colleagues discovered almost universally is that galaxies rotate faster at the edge than they're supposed to. Okay, so those of you who read about dark matter will recognize this is called the galaxy rotation curve problem and Vera Rubin and her colleagues discovered it. So if you take one of those measurements that Rubin and her colleagues made, so this is an exercise that you can do if you take um, intro astronomy or, or junior level astrophysics, uh, is if you take that rotation, you can work out that there's a whole bunch of matter that you can't see, what we call dark matter, here in the galaxy. 
more of it than there is stars. It's clearly here because its gravity is influencing how fast the, the galaxy is rotating, but you can't see it in a telescope. It's dark. And so we have no idea what it is, okay? But we know it's there. And so based on the mapping of the uh, rotation of, of many galaxies, including the Milky Way, we think it's basically this gigantic dark bubble uh, around the galaxy, about the size of the galaxy, probably a little bit bigger. We don't know the true extent. Uh, but these dark matter halos, as we call them, are basically dark balls of dark matter that completely surround the Milky Way. Okay, it's dark because it doesn't illuminate light or it doesn't emit light, so we can't see it in telescopes, but it also doesn't obscure our vision of the distant universe. The only reason that we know it's there is because it gravitationally influences the motion of stars here in the Milky Way. Okay, so hopefully that was uh, good there. Uh, uh, oh, and oh, sorry, I see I missed a question from you, Jim. Ah, so the so Jim's asking about that last movie I showed you uh, in where I was showing the stars that we observe in the uh, Milky Way with Lisa. So those are all white dwarf binaries. So it's a white dwarf orbiting another white dwarf. Um, and so the black ones that are in those, uh, there's actually more of them now. There's about 50 of them known. Those are known white dwarf binaries that we can all see already. Uh, I'll tell you two famous ones. So the famous one right now is one called J0651. So if you type that into Google, you'll get the Wikipedia page for it. So it's an eclipsing white dwarf binary, and it gives us one of the most accurate tests of general relativity uh, that we have uh, to date. It's two white dwarfs. So a white dwarf is a dead star, something the mass of the sun that shrunk down to the size of the Earth but they're in a seven minute orbit around each other. They go around each other once every seven minutes. So it gives you a sense of how fast they're moving. Uh, but the other famous one, which you should look up is, uh, is a white dwarf binary in Canis Venetici. It's called AMCVN. It's a 14th magnitude uh, white dwarf binary. It was the first one that we knew was going to be a strong Lisa source, but it's famous because everything, virtually everything we know about that system was discovered by amateur astronomers. So you can go back through the uh, AAVSO history and get the light curve for AMCVN. Uh, there was a mystery for what its orbital period was for a long, long time. Uh, but in the 1990s, Joe Patterson at Columbia had a group of amateurs that he called the Center for Backyard Astrophysics. And they, uh, they measured AMCBN's uh, period exquisitely, and it's about 1,028 seconds. And so there's a very famous uh, paper uh, that Joe and the amateur astronomers wrote in the Astrophysical Journal about the period of AMCBN. So, uh, so a lot of what we, I enjoy about the stellar graveyard, about the white dwarf binaries, is that there's this nice amateur astronomy connection to it. And I'm, I'm also an amateur astronomer in addition to a, uh, a professional astronomer, so I, so I kind of like that connection. Okay, I think I got all the questions there. I'm sorry I missed your first one there, Jim. I, I just skipped over your name because I knew you answered the first one. So I think I got them all there. Okay, so I think, I think we're done. If someone wants to type one last question into the, into the Q&A there. Shane, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, okay. those of you that are still with us, uh, we are planning a couple more uh, program similar to this in December. One will be a tour of the observatory and then uh, uh, Dr. Fisher from uh, University of Oregon will be doing a presentation. We've invited Shane to come back in the first quarter of 21, so um, which is really not that far away. Believe it or not. Not that far away, kind especially in the pandemic world, so. Yeah, so, um, but once again, uh, we, we hope we can all see you, a lot of you at the observatory soon. We're hoping to reopen again uh, after next Wednesday if, uh, the state allows it and we'll be back to viewing again but uh, at least this week it it's been cloudy so i don't feel as bad about uh, not being able to do um, in public programs so i think we just had another question pop in another one no no thank you oh, thank you. awesome oh, thank wow you. look at that cool thanks uh, everyone <laughs> yeah thank you again everyone for joining us i know a few of you had some uh, issues uh, getting logged in i apologize for that we'll uh, do some research on our end and find out why uh, some of the uh, links were not working correctly. Uh, but we'll we'll get that figured out since um, the virtual world is uh, uh, kind of new for the uh, for those of us that are trying to be in multiple locations at once. So 
thanks again, everyone. I'll let everyone go. Shane, uh, we'll be in touch. Um, have a great uh, Thanksgiving to you and your family. And I uh, hope all of you out there stay safe and have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you again. Take care, everybody. Good to see you. No, I was supposed to hit a button here. I'm going to stop the recording. Mm-hmm. <laughs>